Blog Talk Radio. Um, 
But anyway, if this is your first time listening to the Loser Living in Loserville, I can't even talk right now. Living in Loserville podcast, you can find it right here. It streams live on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Robito Radio. So it streams live and it archives right here. Okay. Um, it's under the Rope and Dope Radio podcast umbrella. Um, it, that's basketball, football, and boxing, just so you know. Um, but, you know, you don't have to go to Blog Talk only. We have a variety of different places where the Living in Loserville podcast exists. Under the Rope and Dope Radio podcast, you can find it at iTunes. Player FM is another great source. We get a lot of hits from Player FM. It's really easy. A lot of people like them that uh, website as they do with tune in tune in we get a lot they got a good app spricker stitcher a whole lot of different places we're also part of the grueling truth sports podcast network that can be found everywhere including on spotify that's right you can stream the show on spotify and iheart radio through the grueling truth sports podcast network that's basketball football baseball boxing and everything in between head on over to the grueling truth.net that's the grueling truth.net you can uh you know you can listen to the podcast right there as well you can read an article they get a lot of different articles a lot of different sports like i said i do a weekly college uh picks on there and then also while you're at it you can place a bet and it'll link you right to mybookie.ag that's mybookie.ag head on over to the to the grueling truth Dot net. I'm going to go ahead and bring in my co-host, Aaron, check his temperature. What's going on, Aaron? How you doing, buddy? Hey, man, I'm doing good. Uh, so, yeah, like you said, the week started off pretty tough. Uh, two terrible losses uh, to start off the week, and I was just down about it. By the time the Gophers got done with that thrashing in Illinois, I was just ready to throw my hands up in the air and just forget about it all. I just almost gave up on both squads, but uh, yeah, I mean, the week sort of mildly improved, and we got a little bit better. A couple tough wins, actually, a couple uh, wins by less than two points. So, yeah, I mean, that Sixers game was incredibly embarrassing. You said you didn't want to spend a lot of time talking about it, but I just can't get over the fact of how embarrassing that was to go in there. I really thought we'd go in there with some fight, a little bit of passion. Nothing. Got nothing. Just got run over by buckets in the bucket bowl 1.0. So I guess we got to look forward to, to 2.0, but I don't think I've seen a more embarrassing Timberwolves display that I can remember than uh, watching that game against Jimmy Butler and the Philadelphia 76ers. I mean, it was disastrous to say the least. I, I agree. I'd have to agree. I mean, as far as the worst thrashing ever, 83 points in the first half. I mean, Got outscored forty to twenty seven, then followed up with forty three to thirty one. That's not even that bad at points putting up, but stop somebody. Embiid always loves playing cat. A lot of these bigs do because they say, "Hey, cat's the pretty boy, huh?" They got a, NBA's got him working in China in the off season, huh? Okay, we're gonna really lay it to him, and it was just. I mean, sure, you can mention a couple of performances, but other than, I mean, there's not much there. D. Rose off the bench was nice, but yeah, man, that was, uh, wow, that was uh, that was just ugly. Butler doing whatever he wanted, same with Embiid. Simmons almost got a triple-double, made him look like he has no problems in his game, which we know that to be not, you know, the case. Obviously, he's a good player, don't get me wrong, he's got a lot of potential. But um, he's got, you know, he's got some, some, some faults, major faults. So we'll kind of get into the Timberwolves. Then a little later in the show, we'll talk Minnesota Gophers. We just kind of split that up. Sometimes we'll just go all over the place. And it's really easy to want to just rant about these uh, Tuesday and Wednesday games from last week, man. That was, uh, that was despicable. You know, one team played as if it was the finals, Aaron, and the other team – it was kind of like, well, it's preseason, right? We can just roll up, and it's only one game out of 82. I mean, that's what it felt like. One team took it serious. The other team was just like sheep. They just, no, nah, we'll just hurt over here in the corner. 
Yeah, and there was nothing, you know, it didn't seem like there was any energy put towards the matchup. Now, I don't know if they didn't want to challenge Jimmy, thinking maybe, you know, he'd get, you know, get off and uh, maybe try not to wake a sleeping giant. I can sort of see that. But to just go out there and to not put up any fight, I mean, they gave a little bit of fight, but not much at all after that first quarter, and they just got run out of the gym. Wiggins was quoted saying, well, it wasn't a usual NBA game. Well, what's a usual NBA game? Do you do you jog for the first three quarters and then turn it on for the fourth? Is that a normal NBA game? I couldn't believe that quote he had, but that, I'm just interpreting it the way that I see it. I just can't understand that. Cat, like you said, is just getting his lunch eaten by Embiid again and again and again, and he doesn't seem to mind. And I just don't understand that about Cat and about Wiggins, how they don't seem to mind right. just getting – trounced on a nightly basis yeah you put up cat put up 13 points in that game three rebounds chris he had three rebounds on the night now he was in a little bit of foul trouble but i mean a guy like that 6 10 6 11 even if you're going against him beat you think you fall backwards into more than three rebounds had a couple assists right 13 points on the night wiggins comes up with 12 points and four rebounds just didn't seem inspired at all like, just seemed like, you know, they wanted to get it over with. And perhaps that's what they want to do. But it caused Jimmy to put on a headband. Did you see that the other night where he had the headband yeah, on? Yeah, I did. Uh, I think it, was it was ridiculous, man. Yeah, that's funny yeah, because I, mean, that's I was just – it's like they – you're right. It's like they just – I think you pinpointed it because I was just about to say it too. It's just like they just wanted to get it over. Are we done yet? Like, can we just – you know, put up the 10 run home run, you know, 10 run rule or something. Can we get out of here? Cause they just, once it was bad, they didn't want to, they, they were done. They were done. No, no more co- yeah. competition that night. No, they wanted no part of it. And, you know, it got 150 points, 149. Uh, that's not an even defensive effort. I mean, you score one seven, so you still score in the ball a little bit, but it was just scattered around. Rose came in, put in 15, you know, Rose is always pretty steady. But if you don't have your two best players, your your uh, max contract players coming out every night, it's just starting to get really frustrating, starting to form a pattern here with the squad. It kind of picked up later in the week against the Spurs and the Suns. But I just really wanted to see Wiggins come out and show, and, and he really didn't show anything at all except for that he wanted to get on the plane and, and get to the next game or, or get back home. So I was disappointed in that. Uh, like you said, we'll not spend too much time on it and, and sort of move on from it. It's just – Never seen a display like that, especially, you know, when I was thinking that maybe they'd show a little life, but they certainly didn't. No, not even a little, like you said. Now, things got a little bit better on Friday night against San Antonio. Well, I should say a little bit. We got a lot better if you look at the score and whatnot. Um, It was a, a pretty closely played game for the most part. We had a little lead. They had a little lead. Uh, um, Some issues, especially in the second half, that stood out. Once again, Cat, you know, Carl Anthony Towns, early in the third, foul problems, picked up his fourth, and in the fourth quarter, you know, um, it, he had foul problems. Again, he definitely could have made a difference in the second half, and especially late in the fourth quarter. you got to have your franchise guy on the floor, and we talked about it last week about these fouls and, you know, leading the league in fouls, and it's just – I don't, I don't get it. It'd be, it'd be different if he was leading the league in blocks and kind of like a, a baseball player. You lead the league in home runs, good chance you're going to lead the league in strikeouts. Okay, well, at least you're doing that. But um, it just, it, it's coming up to bite us left and right. And uh, it's funny that the, the foul issue early in the third when he picked up that fourth foul, um, we actually went on a run, got up by 10. We just couldn't sustain it, and that's where Cat comes in, especially in the fourth quarter, too. We get a little lead, they come back to the pack. Then they got a little lead, and I did like how we kept grinding down the stretch, even though Towns wasn't really able to give enough minutes there and be productive for us. I did like what I saw to make that a much closer game, especially at the end. It got really close, and then, of course, you know, we, we, we fell short anyway. Yeah, we really, you know, and that's a game I really thought that stood out, the absence of, of, of Covington really stood out. Uh, a, a good quality defensive piece that can come in and rebound, get some shots, 
off, the, you know, get some shots off rebounds, get some dirty buckets, some steals. I thought that would have really helped that game uh, against the Spurs. I thought that Rose again came out. He's playing well. It's just kind of you find yourself in that position where we need to settle in at, at that point. Is Rose going to come off the bench? Is he going to play point? To me, he's more of a kind of a combo guard you want to have in there. Yeah. You know, I don't know if we play a lot of Rose and Tyus, but I thought maybe we could do a little bit of moving around and seeing what we like uh, at the point guard spot there. Uh, you know, I think that Cat Aldrich matchup should go Cat's way every time. And I think they were pretty close as far as scoring, but, you know, at the end there, Aldridge got the last shot and went ahead and sank it for the win. And, you know, the Spurs, they seem to just keep retooling. They seem to just find players, fill spots, and find themselves in pretty good position in the Western Conference every year. And it kind of makes you think, well, what are they doing that we're not? But that's neither here nor there. Uh, I thought that the game kind of went the way it was going to go. I thought they'd pull that out at the end. Like you said, they made a little push. And I really thought that would extend, but the Spurs came out, played a little defense, and that was that. To the line, a whole bunch of the Wolves did 32 of 38. Um, shot the ball overall just decently, really bad, though, from 3, 7 of 26 compared to 11 of 24. Um, that was kind of a little bit of a difference maker. And once again, defense, although we played some of it, they shot 50%. Overall, so um, it was definitely a, a you know a lot of foul problems going on. That's for sure. I mean, a combined sixty something free throws, <laughs> um, but at least the effort was there. And like I said, to, to make that nice little run, um, you know, when it looked like the Spurs had gotten just enough to take it away, and, and it didn't look like it was going to be necessarily a um, a chance to win there near the end, all of a sudden in a short amount of time, we were able to, uh, you know, at least make it a very tight game. But in the end, um, you know, they, they fell short. It is the Spurs. Like you said, uh, I think not just us, a lot of people are pointing to them saying, Hey, what the hell are we doing? That They're not because they have made uh, the right moves um, through minor trades. Uh, having a guy like Rudy Gay, who was starting to fall off as a as a uh, high caliber starter, found a second home. I mean, time after time they've done that, done that really well. And then early second round, late first round, the guys they've found over the years is uh, it's pretty silly and impressive <laughs> when you uh, really look back at it. Um, last night they, they we needed to stop the bleeding. The bleeding was, you know, really bad for, for both sides, really. The Gophers are both sides, both teams, Gophers, you know, having lost two in a row as well. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. They did beat the Rutgers. But anyway, um, now Phoenix at home, that game needed to be a, a win, period. Um, we still made it ugly. They didn't have their uh, first-round pick, Aiton. He was uh, hurt, started out pretty bad missed like three makeable challenge layups early bad turnovers um koji kind of came out a little too aggressive like we talked about last week on offense picked up two quick falls i will say this though it did seem like the refs were missing some clear falls especially on drives i think four or five early drives uh no call two of them on wiggins um but we were just ice cold from the field four of 16 Nearing the end of the first, I think we were down 19-14. to 14. Really, it seemed like Cat was the only guy, starter-wise, that showed up. He had 15 fairly early in that game. I think in the first quarter, had a big uh, first half in general. Huge first half. Um, but he was like 8-8 eight, eight from the free throw. I think he got all the way to 10-9, to nine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Suns did lead. At the end of that first, second quarter came around. Suns, you know, made a 12-0 run. Take a nine-point lead real early, and you're like, here we go. This is not good. You know, it's a home game. We need this game. Let's come out and play with some tenacity, like like we care. And if you look at the, the, the battle of the free throw line early, it was 22-8. to eight. Just getting – now, like I said, I, I do think there was some ref – missing you know some refs missing some calls but still 
that's what, 12? Then you're still 22 to 12. Uh, and the bench of the Suns had, you know, real quick, like, handful of points right away. And overall, um, they were just killing us on the bench for a long, I think for the most of the game. Um, now, we did manage to grind back into it. I think we were still down by 10 with five minutes. Um, you did see Cat kind of get it to like 55 to 50, 55 to 50, and then at half it was 67 to 64. Um, Gibson had 13 points. Like I said, Cat had 28, I believe, at half, something like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, the free throw advantage started favoring us. Now the Sun still had it. Big thing at half were fast break points and second chance. And something before I start talking about the second half of the game in general, I'll pass it to you. The fast break points didn't have a fast break point till late in the third. And the second chance points killed us all game. The Suns, I noticed, went to a small lineup. And it messed with us until later in the game as well. So I wasn't too happy with that first half um, because it felt like, dude, we got to come out and establish something here. We got to we got to beat this team that's like on their third game in five nights or something like that. So I was a little disappointed. I did like how we cut the lead, but I thought, oh, here we go. Let, this is going to happen again. And, and sure enough, you know, third quarter. Boom, they get out to a lead. What did you think of that first half, though, when they did get up by 10 and kind of held it for a while? It just, like I said, they, they, they don't have their number one pick. He's not a great player by any stretch, but it's still a man down. Now, you could say Covington's very important to us. We don't have him. And, and then, obviously, now another injury with Tyus. Our point guards, we can't keep healthy at one time. But what were you thinking here in the first half and just, just overall? of the game as we break this thing down from last night. I thought the first half was sort of what you see generally two teams trying to just kind of get through the first half and work towards the second. Yeah. yeah the, the whistles were a little tight, you know, on our end. They, it was hard to really tell what crew is going to come and, and work the game. And it's, it's, it's we don't get calls and then we get all the calls and then we don't get any calls and then we don't go it's feast or famine. It seems like as far as the whistle goes and, and you know, the first, it just sort of seemed like a trudge and I wanted to see the wolves break out a little bit more in the first half, seeing that the Suns, like you said, were coming off uh, a bunch of games in a row and one of the worst teams in the Western conference, as far as record wise goes. But then, you know, the Suns they were smelling blood and they came in thinking, well, you know, we may not get many wins, but we could get one here tonight. So they played pretty tough. And you're right, that small lineup did have a little problem. I think that has to do with maybe uh, our lack of, of, like I said earlier, the, the front court, the point guard, and, and the shooting guard positions. Sure. Still kind of being in flux and, and not knowing what's going on. So you go to a small lineup and force that to, to uh, work against you. It could be pretty tough. I thought we ran, got out and ran the ball pretty well. I thought that shooting-wise it was pretty good, Cat came on strong. Rose played a really nice game and what he did in the fourth. I'm sure we'll get to that. But I thought the real key to that game was uh, 17 points from, from Gibson, just being a strong force uh, down low, kind of a stabilizer in a way to kind of settle everybody down and work towards uh, getting that win in the second half. So overall, it was like you said, it was a win that we needed. We had to have it. And now we turn around and got the Suns again. So uh, you know, we go down to their place and we should win. We need to win we need to beat the Suns uh, a little bit more uh, definitively uh, to have a little more confidence uh, for the rest of the season. I just don't think you should be struggling against the Phoenix Suns. Right. And they already beat us earlier this year. So you do want to win the series with them, right? So that means we got to win this next game. Um, you know, Wiggins couldn't buy a bucket or a foul for that matter. Uh, the third quarter started out pretty ugly. I think under seven, it was still 75, 72 Wolves down. Then the Suns went on like an 8-0 run, did get it to 83, 75. And I thought, oh boy, it's going to work out like the second quarter here where they start to get up by 10 and all that. Um, and Wiggins got followed on a three. And we, we know he's not a good free throw shooter. However, this whole double breath 
with the ball on his hip free throw line routine mm-hmm. needs to be shortened to a dribble, a dribble, a dribble in a breath, and just shoot the fucking thing. Because you can't, Aaron, have the ball on your hip. You need your form. If anything, breathe and fake the routine. Not fake it, but, you know, do the arm thing. And, okay, let's let's see the finesse off your wrist. That's fine. You can take deep breaths while you do that. But for me, to not even be all the way set and to have the ball on the hip, literally on the hip, sometimes not even two hands on it, it's like, nah, dude, that's not it. Two breaths sit there forever to me it just it's too much time he's got an issue there we i think his best year was 75 percent. i'll take 75 percent. that's fine we'll get over that but you gotta you, know, you hear what i'm saying with this wiggins double breath ball on the hip what the hell is that i couldn't tell you i mean like you said he's shooting 75 percent. you will take that if it ain't broke, then, then why fix it? What are you doing? Is it attention seeking? Are you trying to come up with some new style points and ways to shoot? I just don't understand why you don't just take two dribbles, take a breath, and shoot it. Uh, you know, like maybe he's trying to add some swag or something. I don't know, but you know, I'm. You know, we could talk for an hour and a half about Wiggins and what we think and what we don't. He's just one of the more frustrating players that I've ever watched, you just, you never know what you're going to get. I mean, I have some theories. I don't want to break into it too far, but you you just want consistency. And that is like a, that is the hardest thing to, to try to find with him because the nights he'll have, you know, he'll go off for 40 and then the next night he'll have four and two rebounds. And I think he had what, one game this year where he had two points and, and one rebound or something. I mean, you just don't know what you're going to get and you just wonder why that is. And now he's, doing something with the free throws. Yeah, I think maybe he's looking to find something. You know, it's 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 anybody's guess, man. I, I couldn't I can't explain it and I don't even want to try really. It's just I think you're right. I think he needs to go back to just making the shot and uh forget about the style points. And you know, I really think it's he did talk about this last season of of, you know, how you can get in your head a little bit. You can get a little nervous. You can have anxiety on the line when you're missing a lot. Of course, dude, you can see it in a player's face, in their demeanor. That's that's cool. But why sit on that line longer then? If you're having anxiety, fucking dribble, take a breath, and go then. You know, let's not sit around and double dribble with the ball on the hip. Like, I can't. I, I just don't get it. But anyway, let's move on because, like you said, it could be a whole show. On Wiggins, um, if you look at the threes at some point in the third, it was 11-4 to four for the Suns' advantage. Two minutes left of the uh, the third, actually. They were up 91-80. to 80. I'm just like, okay, dude, this is – this is, we're going to lose this freaking game, dude. We're going to lose this freaking game. And then Rose to the rescue, sparked, a, sparked us off the bench. <clears throat> I think he got back-to-back buckets late. Just going to the hole, got that steal as well. I think he scored 17 points in that quarter, and and there was about five drives, and he hit four of them in a row. Um, We were down by 11 was the highest. Got it down to 96-91. And uh, started the fourth quarter great. The bench played great. Tulliver definitely gave us some quality minutes. We're starting to see that a little bit more uh, in the last week or so that he's got playing time. And they took the lead. Started out 9-0 and run, 97-96. Now you're like, here we go, here we go, here we go. And it kind of just lingered really close for the rest of the quarter. And with four minutes left, it was 108-104. And uh, Rose finally, they did get a little push there. I think it was an 8-0 run. Rose finally stopped that. And with two minutes left, 112-111, um, Crawford had an N1 <laughs> after giving up, what do you know, more offensive rebounds. Um, of course, Wiggins got fouled but missed both of them. Cat uh, did have a nice steal, which led to a bucket and, and put him up 114-113. Um, there was the turnover pass to Rose. He was fouled with like 30 seconds left. He did miss one to tie it up. Um, Gibson got a great steal. You mentioned Gibson. I really like him. And, you know, 
I understand that a lot of people say the game has passed him, but if you look at his outside shot, I believe it's right about 37% from the three. Doesn't take a whole lot. I just love that they're not going to double and triple him a bunch, you know, but every time you give him the ball in the paint, the percentage of him scoring or getting fouled is very, very high. So that was a big one, uh, big steal. And, you know, I noticed, he, so he made the steal, did Gibson, called the timeout, and I noticed they had the huddle, and Rose said something to himself or said a quick prayer or something. He said it to himself, you know, right before he stepped basically on the court. And with point six left, he hits that little step back to, and he was really just training those maybe 16, 17-foot you know, jumpers off the dribble. A lot of them are step backs. Point six left. Hits the bucket. 29 points in the second half. And D. Rose, it's a great chance that D. Rose, because of his, you know, popularity in general, he's such a good story. Chicago's such a huge place that he's getting a lot of all-star votes there. Of course, he's getting some here. He's big in China as well, so he's getting votes there. This guy is like seventh in the league right now. In votes, it's a great story. It really is. We really, really needed that bucket. It was just nice to see it. And once you once you have Rose going, he can pass. He can pass. But once he's going with that one on one, you know, I like our chances with him, especially off the bench. I don't necessarily like Rose in the starting lineup because he shoots too much. Like he said, he's a tweener. But, man, that was clutch. And down the stretch, he was clutch. Man, I got to tell you, I hated that shot until it went in. You know, they pulled the four guys out, <laughs> ran ice all for Rose. I'm thinking, you know, you're quick, man. Get to the bucket. And uh, I was, no, 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 yes. You know, because I, I just thought, oh, it was a terrible shot, a little step-back jumper when you could have beat the guy off the dribble. But, yeah, he made the shot. and. It was good to see for the win. It, it just it was too close for comfort, man. It's, with the Phoenix Suns, you should be you know you should be winning yeah. that game pretty pretty uh, handily. So you know it was a tough game, but you know we got the W. That's what counts. And uh, moving the record up, you know, we can't we keep staying two games under 500. We can't seem to break that. And uh, D Rose, I, I'm not sure where his his popularity comes from. Is, is it from Chicago? Is he from Chicago? Is that what the deal is? I, I can't because I mean it's all well, over he's the, from Chicago, the internet. And, and remember, all star votes are straight up the fans all over the world. So it, it 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 that's that's what it is. He's huge in China. And remember, he was like the third or fourth most popular player in his prime, and that was not that long ago. So I think it's it's Chicago, you know, obviously the third biggest city in the country. So Chicago, China, and just the love he had about six, seven years ago, people really feel bad about how many times he got hurt, youngest MVP ever. I think that has a lot to do with it, you know, just the the love for him. I think that is. And by the way, the Wolves are now five and eight in two possession games this season after that game. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, think about where we would be without Rose this season. Uh, I mean, we'd have literally sure. no star power. Well, we'd have Towns and Wiggins, the enigma that are those two. So I guess half the time we'd have Towns and Wiggins. But, uh, you know, he's really been our star player uh, so far in the season We lost since we lost Jimmy. And even right before we lost Jimmy, he's just kind of step up and Rose. I think he's like the team leader, I would hope. Uh, it. And he's played really, really well for for being a comeback player and just kind of being on the scrap heap off, getting him off the scrap heap last last year. So, I thought that yeah, without him, like 31 points that night, uh, and he continues to to put up good numbers for us. And uh, he, it's just hard to think where we would be without him, especially now that Tyus is down and and we're in some trouble in that position. So I'm glad we got him. I'm real happy with him. I like him as a player. Uh, and now I know a little bit more about why he's so popular. It's just He's just really, really popular over the internet, and I never really knew why. I thought maybe he had a lot of love coming out of Chicago, and that just kind of held over, but you're right. With all the injuries and, you know, uh, situations of coming back, I think it's a good story, too. Yeah, it really is, and you know, this stretch we got 
coming up, man, there's two stretches, okay? The, the, the short-term stretch is four games in the next six nights. It doesn't ha- happen as much as it used to because they started the, you know, the schedule. They started the, the actual regular season two weeks before or normally these last two years, so it doesn't happen as much. But four games in six nights, and we're actually last night started a stretch of nine Western Conference opponents in a row. Obviously, important, you know, to say the least. Um, like we said, we have a game coming up on Phoenix tomorrow. Must win. Then you play the Lakers. Must win because they don't have Bronny. You must beat the Lakers if they don't have Bronny. You could beat them with Bronny, but you got to beat them without Bronny. It just, it, it's just a must. And then we got these home and homes, just like we have with Phoenix. We got a home and home with Utah. So we got to steal one of those as well. This four game six nights is going to be telling. By the time we do the show next Monday, it's going to be really telling where we're at in general. And like you said, it's the fight to 500. Every time we get within one point, boom, two game losing streak. And it's just got to stop at some point. We've actually had a couple of nice runs this year. We've had a four and a five game winning streak. But um, we got to have these next two games and then split with Utah, man. I, I think it's a must as we stand right now because now, what are we, three games out? I think it's three games out of that A spot. And, and this next month is important. You know, the February 9th is a trade deadline. Obviously, in, in upcoming shows, we'll talk about that. But this stretch, man, this is going to say a lot in the short term of where we're at for this year, uh, for trades potentially. When do you, you know, stop trying to win the whole nine? I mean, this stuff is huge. Nine Western Conference wise, full eight now in a row. And some winnable games coming up before it gets even more difficult. That's for sure with Golden State and Denver and OKC again. Yep, we got the Suns, and I think we'll win that game on the road. I think that will probably be the toughest. Uh, I think maybe the toughest game besides uh, going to the road to Utah. Um, I think we'll beat the Lakers. Uh, if there's ever a game where Cat and Wigger are going to be charged up, they'll be playing in L.A. So I'm fairly confident they'll come out and show well for that game. Uh, so I think you get through the Suns game, if you can, uh, with a win. shouldn't be uh, too difficult, but it has been. They beat us. We beat them. So the series with them. Uh, I think Rubio's still out with the Jazz. I um, don't think he'll be back. So that kind of changes the outlook there. And, and the Jazz yeah. are kind of playing like we are. You know, they haven't had the greatest year. So you get a chance to maybe go, you know, three out of the four, possibly four out of the four. And if you can do that, then you're in pretty good shape and makes the trade deadline look a little bit differently as opposed to if you go two and two, one and three, you know, maybe you start thinking about moving some guys. I don't think quite yet, but, you know, you're right. At the end of the next month, you start to think about, you know, do we try to make the lottery? Do we try to go forward and try to make the playoffs? You kind of have to make that decision in that month. It'd be nice to get up above 500 uh, at the end of these four games. And I think it's a distinct possibility we could be one game up, and that would uh, change the outlook a little bit uh, going into the next month. Yeah, it definitely would, man. And uh, anything else, Timberwolves-wise, before we get into these beloved Minnesota Gophers? No, you know, I think we'll see how that week goes, but Let's talk about this Illinois game. That was another infuriating game. I, It just – you thought they'd play better. I didn't necessarily think they'd win. I kind of thought they'd lay an egg on the road. But I did not see uh, 95 to 68 and just thoroughly getting killed and ran out of the gym by a lower team in the Big Ten. Now, they could come on and win a few games because they're not a terrible team. They just haven't really come together right. yet, and neither have we. You know, uh, we're still a little bit, still got problems at the point guard position, and and that's getting to, starting to be a bigger problem than I had thought it would be, and it kind of showed there. And we didn't really have an answer. We, you know, we tried Washington, we tried uh, the kid from uh, Stahl, I think his name is. We tried a lot of different options, yep. and we just couldn't get anything going, and we weren't getting calls, and that sort of compounded. We weren't making shots. 
uh, or Turu was our leader, leading scorer with 17 points. Murphy had a bad game. Everybody just had a bad game. So I'm going to chalk it up to laying an egg, although we didn't come back that well against Penn State. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That I mean, 51 points in the first half. That's a 20-minute game. I mean, or 20-minute half, whatever. It, it was just despicable. 51 points you give up? Orturo showed up. Washington off the bench actually had a decent game, but it didn't matter. We were out of the game. You know, we 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 didn't. We still gave up 44 in the second half. Yeah, we put up 40. Great, but you still gave up 44. It's just, and you're right. Illinois is a better. That was their first win in conference play, but that was only their fourth win overall. Or I'm sorry, fifth win overall. You know, sure, they could be a little better, but Jesus Christ, they got five wins on the season. Like, you can't go in there and just think that you're going to win like that. Like, you got to take it, and you got to take it by the balls. And we talk about this on the college ball show, too. It's hard to win on the road in college basketball, especially in a high profile, you know, conference, which is the Big Ten. But you got to be ready way more than that this team defensively is not as strong as the last couple of years it doesn't look like a patino consistent defensive team um yeah that was that was just bad man that was bad that was uh that was the was that the worst loss in uh in in young patino's uh the, the patino era i'd have to say it it was I mean, what else was worse than that? A four-win team just get smashed, curb stomped, like I said earlier. Yeah, I mean, that's – I mean, they just got smashed. And, I mean, it was – it seemed like down that it didn't start off well, and then that got in their heads, and then it didn't continue well, and then it just kind of became this uh, downward spiral of a game. And it, they started asking for calls a little too much, so therefore they weren't right. getting the calls. And they just got out physical and the defensive uh, presence, like you said, it just it isn't there. They haven't gelled together on that, and I don't think they brought, like, just the kind of toughness. Now, you're starting a few freshmen, which, you know, you can kind of sure. say that's an excuse. Uh, they're not quite used to the way the Big Ten is, and then maybe they're learning. But, you know, I, I kind of put that up. I said, okay, well, that was a terrible loss in Illinois. Maybe you learn a lesson, although we did kind of get run by Ohio State earlier in the same sort of way. Uh, maybe not a uh, difference in the score, but, you know, it's the physical teams. You know, so when you face a Michigan State where they're just going to pound you and pound you, you know, it makes me kind of wonder about what the future holds. Uh, Michigan's not as physical, but they're they're pretty physical too, and I think the physicality needs to go up. And, I was expecting maybe to come out and you'd run Penn State and kind of get everything right, but it didn't work out that way, and you're just sweating a shot, a wide-open shot at the end of the game to win it for Penn State, and luckily they missed it. And you could see the relief on Patino's face when that shot didn't go in. (laughs) I think he thought it was going to go in, and he just looked like he was sweating bullets out there. And I would be too because the way the media would have handled him losing those two games. We said before he wanted to go three and one during that four-game stretch, and we ended up going right. two and two, which is livable, but the wins didn't come where we thought they'd come, and the losses didn't come where we thought they'd come. And now you're just kind of left thinking, well, you know, we had a lot of high hopes for this team at, at now 14 and four. Now you're wondering how we're going to get through this Big Ten schedule and possibly make the tournament. Going to be a grind. There's no doubt about it. And the road in general, I mean, at home, sure pretty damn good club. I think it'll improve as we go, uh, especially when the bigger names come in. That place gets loud. I will say this. The other night in that cold weather, I heard Patino after the game say, I don't really want to tell you to like, say on camera what the temperature is right now because recruits may be watching. But um, to get 11,000 plus in that, in that night, on uh, Sunday night in that cold with the you know football going on and everything, that was nice. But back to the road. Now, neutral site, hey, we're we're fine. We're loosey goosey on a on a on a you know a different country. Yeah, we can do that. Neutral site, no problem. Home, no problem. Road, 
whole host of problems. That Boston College game, 68 to 56, it felt worse than that, score wise. It felt more like the 79 to 59 loss that we just got beat up early December at Ohio State. And now we did get a big, big win against Wisconsin, who just beat Michigan just in time. For us to play them too, by the way, that that totally takes the uh, the the potential upset out of the way because now they're focused again. Um, but then to get the worst loss, maybe well, I'd say in his era, but the the Patino era, but the worst loss of the season comes against probably one of the worst. Well, the not the I don't know somewhere in there as far as you know Power Five. Oh God! It just—I just don't. We gotta improve on the road, and here we go. We gotta play Michigan now. So I don't know, but as far as that game, thank God they were able to stop the bleeding. But it, we were still bleeding out for a lot of that game, like you said. They came out fast as hell. We came out a tad slow, and what do you know? We're down ten points, and, and you know they got like ten, twelve points in the freaking paint. Um. Yeah, in fact, I got notes here. 12-minute mark, we're down by 10 already. It seems like Murphy and Curry. Curry had a bad game, now has bounced back a little bit, a couple of games back. Murphy and Curry are playing well on both sides of the ball. Uh, they were able to cut it and make a run with four minutes left of that first half, got it to 26-23. Um, but then, you know, second half, what do you know? Down 44 to 34, three minutes in, and you're like, dude, McBrayer and uh, Coffee didn't shoot well. Um, but they did get to the free throw line. I'll say that. Finally, the Gophers started to improve on defense, and that kind of sparked a rally. Got it to 48 to 44, 13 minutes left. And you're like, okay, guys, this is it, man. This is it. You got to make your stand. You got to stop the bleeding. And we respond with, oh, Penn State makes a little run out of the timeout. It's 51-44. And you're thinking right for the 12-minute the, the, the timeout, TV timeout. It's like, Jesus. Um, you know, luckily, we made another run, 10-3. to 3, Got it to 51-50. to 50, Nine minutes left. Now, Artura had a nice stretch of minutes down the line or down the, you know, down the way of the game. And Murphy closed very, very strong and had a monster game. I mean, Murphy, thank God for Murphy in that game. And he needed to break out. And even Patino was talking about this at his pressure, saying sometimes a couple years ago, Murphy would kind of get lost in in having to get his post game going. And sometimes he'll get, you know, doubled and tripled. Sometimes, or a lot of times, a lot of times he may, you know, lose the ball or whatever. I guess he – Lately, he's been trying to establish it with not as much success as he wants. And Patino's like, just just forget that, dude. I remember saying this a couple years ago. Just forget about it. Just do you. And what do you know? 19 points led the team. Led the team with 21 rebounds. That's a whole lot of rebounds in general, but in a 40-minute game, that's ridiculous. He didn't stop there, Aaron. Team high, six assists. Team high, three blocks and three steals to go along with uh, a monster dunk there um, to, uh, well, I wouldn't say to make it comfortable, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, thank God Penn State. Now, some of that had to do with defense, but Penn State did shoot, you know, pretty bad in the second half. They still had defense, though. Um, hitting shots like late, tough shots late in the clock. That was another thing. Um, so it was 61 to 61 with 240 left. That replay that they were, the, uh, the replay they didn't even need to do, it took forever. I remember right. <laughs> I remember that part. Um, and you know that basically Murphy called the you know called game in a sense. He ended up getting it get to go up 64 61 with that dunk. Of course, you know, Lamar Stevens come back with a bucket and one. And here we are, 64-61, and McBrayer did get tripped, got a fall, got one of them. But like you said, that Stevenson, that Lamar Stevenson just barely missed it to go ahead. And 
So we got it done. We stopped the bleeding. Um, we're sixth in the Big Ten. We're okay. We are okay. We just – well, we need to win one of these two games. Uh, I mean, at Michigan, it's going to be a tough task. It's a tall order. You can't really just assume, especially, you know, with Wisconsin having just knocked them off, giving their first, you know, defeat of the year. There's no way they're not going to be tuned in when they play us tomorrow night. But that game on Sunday, I believe, is it Sunday? Yes, it's Sunday. Iowa at home. So we got back-to-back ranked teams. Iowa is up to 19. You know, I'm not just giving up the Michigan game like here, have it. Like, I understand if we lose, but the, they must show up and play and try to stay within single digits throughout the game because they just need it for that. We talked about how, you know, beating Phoenix this next time for the Wolves, just a confidence standpoint that you know you're better than that team. Go beat them. Just stay with them and show some pride on the road for once besides Madison. I couldn't agree more. You know, I'm not gonna, just going to give the game to Michigan either, although I think they will win. Uh, but it would be nice to see it, the, the, Wolf, uh, the Gophers go down and uh, and play tough and have a little fire. You know, I'm sick of watching these squads come out and not play, you know, consistently with uh, the kind of, of, of energy that you need to win to win games. It seems like uh, a lot of these squads are just coming out and, you know, walking through it. It's just you can't win like that, especially now with this crowded Big Ten who could get ten teams in the tournament. Everybody's good. Uh, night in, night out, home or away. You've got to come out and, and play consistently and, you know, have an identity as a team. And I don't think this squad does yet. I think starting to form that, and, of course, we're still pretty early in the season, but, you know, it's getting later and later every day. And Michigan's tough. Now, they lost to Wisconsin in the Cole Center. I can see where that, you know, like, again, that's a tough place to play. Every call right. goes, goes Wisconsin's way. So, you know, it's tough to say – what kind of win that was for Wisconsin, but you need Wisconsin to keep winning because we beat them. Uh, so, you know, I, I like Michigan in this game. I think they're going to win. I'd really like to see the Gophers come in and make a statement, but I just don't see that coming after uh, Michigan lost to Wisconsin. I think you're right. I think they're going to be tuned up and ready to go. I hope we don't get ran out of the gym on that one. Uh, let's hope we keep it close. Within 10 is probably where you want to be because even Patino said he's not sure of what the criteria is for the tournament this year. He kind of threw that out there. So said, is it, is yep. it record? Just about to bring is it that uh, how we're playing? Yep. And so we don't really know. Now, Iowa's tough. And going into that game, you know, it's a rivalry. And Iowa's always tough, rivalry or not. They just play us tough, and we play them tough. So hopefully that will be a game with a lot of energy, a home game. Hopefully we can win that one. But you're right. We've got to win one of these next two to feel comfortable. Uh, if you lose them both, it's starting to look like a downward spiral. Yeah, you win them both, and, you know, the sky's the limit. Get the split on it. I think that uh, it'll at least be good enough. Now, I think we might get the win against Iowa. It depends on how they come up to play. But, you know, you got to have one of them, and I think that's your best chance at Iowa. Gonna, we are going to talk a little bit about that at some point as we get closer and closer to the end of the season, the uh, the new net rating where they care about you smashing a bad team. Um, there's a 10-point cap system that if you beat a team by 10, like just some weird stuff. You look at NC State and where they're ranked, if you look at their non-conference in their strength of schedule, their non-conference strength of schedule is just – it's 350 out of 353, but yet they were at 31 because they had beaten, um, you know, a bad team really bad or really good, I guess you could say. So we are going to talk about this new net rating. Um, the RPI is out, this new net net neutrality. I don't know what they're doing here, but uh, we got quad <laughs> systems. We got quad systems. We got a new net, quad one, quad two, quad three. This is a new matrix. I don't know what the hell is going on, but we're going we're gonna to have to obey. So let's see. Let's see what we do here. 
Um, I don't know, but that uh, that game with Iowa is crucial, man. To be able to get a, a rank under our belt, Washington's looking really good right now. Let's hope and pray and, and knock on wood. They're four and zero. Please win the Pac-12. Please win the Pac-12. But yeah, Iowa's won five in a row. They lost to Purdue, which Purdue, you know, they have Edwards, and then they have some youth and some veterans that didn't play a whole lot uh, the last three years of their really solid run of Purdue basketball. A lot of those guys are either in the pros or, you know, playing somewhere, not there. And so it took them a little while, Purdue, long story short, (laughs) to get to my point, to get their stuff together. Now they have, I believe they're fourth right now. They're looking a lot better, but that was their last loss. That was their first conference game, or at least of the year. And now they're on a nice little run. You know, they beat Nebraska, beat Northwestern, beat Ohio State, beat Penn State, and beat Illinois. And they beat Illinois like Illinois beat us. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, so they're they're playing a really good ball. And they have a spread team generally, solid players. They'll have one or two guys that kind of stand out. But they're just a solid club, well coached. Like you said, it, it is a rivalry game. And uh, there actually was a caller on that I was going to maybe go to, uh, but they hadn't pressed one. So 717, if you're on, you want to talk, you know, feel free. If not, you just want to show that's true. That, that's cool, too. Um, did notice, we talked about the small lineup um, that uh, Phoenix used on the Timberwolves. Well, I noticed Curry, Curry in Washington in that Penn State game. And that is a lineup, uh, well, we're going to see more in the future as far as next year. But that's that was an interesting lineup. And it added a little bit more. Um, I, I think that we're going to see a little bit more of that lineup. Uh, Washington was moving the ball, pushing the ball. Wasn't so, you know, wasn't Coffee and McBrayer weren't, weren't so, like, paying attention to run the offense where they could be a little bit more freer because, like I said, they weren't hitting their outside shots, but they kept getting to the rack. And I do think Washington's been playing good in spurts. Um, We just need him to be instant energy right away. And and he is figuring out his game. It's taken him a little while. I know locally a lot of people are down on him. Anytime you're Mr. New York City, uh, you know, you're going to get some hype with you. But he has played pretty good this year. But, yeah, with Curry and uh, nothing against Arturo, who's played good lately. But I did notice that lineup had some success and really kept us in that Penn State game. Uh, But that Iowa game, to say must win this early, but it's pretty damn close to it. It'd be a really good win because then the next game, a couple days later, actually, would be Illinois at home, and you know we're going to be chomping at the bit. Oh, well, at least we hope. <laughs> Anything else yeah, that well, you'd we... like to discuss about a couple of uh, items here with the, the Gophers, our Gophers? Uh, you know, they better be chomping at the bit to see Illinois again. If they're not, we got some serious issues. Um, you know, I'm still a little bit, as far as the Gophers go, We've got to solve this point guard position. Now, you brought up Washington, and I'm not quite sure uh, what the problem there is if Patino's asking him to do something that's sort of out of his wheelhouse or if he just can't uh, fold into what Patino wants him to do. I kind of keep an eye on him, trying to watch him and, and see, you know, maybe there's some strain there or what. You know, his pacing's a little bit off. He needs to know when to slow down and speed up. I think that's an issue with him. Uh, his shooting. And overall, you know, the whole team shooting, both free throws and field goals, really needs to improve. They're not shooting well right now. They need to get that back. And, uh, you know, three-point shots will come if you can just improve your shooting a little bit. But like, you don't have a lot of time to uh, to get it right with how competitive the Big Ten is. So you got to really come out and, and work on that. Now, Washington, to me, you really need – if we're going to have a run in the tournament or even make the tournament – we're going to need him to step in and fill that spot at some point. He's got to come around 
uh, this season for that to happen because we just don't have a lot of options. Coffee, I think that's what Illinois did really well was was uh, handle uh, and uh, defend him really, really well. Yep. He couldn't get inside. He couldn't drive. And they really cut him off, which was smart defensively. So we need a guy like Washington. Now, what I would ask Washington to do would be to come in and run the game. And I don't care if he shoots or not. Don't shoot. Don't do anything. Pace the game. Keep it under control. Uh, get your guys into the sets that they need to get in. Get back on defense. Those kind of things, the smaller points of being a point guard before you, you shoot it. And I think that's what he's having a hard time doing. I think you see his watch is kind of wound up a little tight, and he needs to kind of pull it back and just slow down and think a little bit more. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of New York City point guards, always have been, Kenny Anderson and so forth. And he was good like that at Georgia Tech. And then he needed to kind of take a step back. And, you know, I'm, I, don't, I think that Washington will get there eventually, but we need that to hurry up now. We, because now we're in a spot not getting Trey Jones, which I thought was maybe the spot that we thought he was going to come in and play. We left a spot open for him in case he wanted to come. And so now Washington's in there, and we don't have Trey Jones. And now Trey Jones is hurt, but that's a different story. I think we need to get – Washington really needs to assume the non-scoring, uh, non uh aggressive, I guess, maybe not be so aggressive, uh, point guard role, and just sort of be a facilitator and get the team uh, through. Otherwise, we're in really big trouble at the point guard position, Chris, and I think it's really starting to show. Yeah, especially in the Big Ten, especially when the game slows down. You're right, no doubt about it. And You know, maybe I'm not feeling as bad, being that it's almost a week ago and I put it in my rear view with that Philly loss. Philly's up 92 to 63 end of the third quarter, or basically the end of the third, third quarter gets a smoking hot Houston team, or at least James Harden has been on fire lately. This guy, what is it? 15 in a row, 30 point games. <laughs> wow. This guy's crazy. Yeah. But Hey, it's not that bad. It's not that they're getting beat by 29. So maybe they can add 20 <laughs> points to that and they can get another 40. And it can make a – okay, I'm just – I'm reaching. I'm reaching. I think it's uh, about time to shut this thing down. How about some Kelsher three? Can we get Gabe involved? Can we get that guy involved? He sure was involved early in the season, wasn't he? I mean, he had, what, five or six threes early in that in that first, uh, first half of those tournament games? Like, we need some Kelsher because that guy, you get him going, he can hit a three. He's just been off. Ever since Big Ten play, really. Yeah, you know, that's another thing, like I said about the shooting. Like, he's just been off, too, and when we have one shooter and, and he's not making shots, that's, that's a problem. And I know McBrayer's been, been hitting a few of them, which is good, but uh, you want to see Kelsher get his stroke back and start to make uh, shots with a little bit more consistency. I think that's another part of the backcourt right now is just the issue. If we can get that tuned up, and get playing uh, in the Big Ten. I think that uh, things will start going a little bit more away. You got a big test with Michigan. We'll see how that goes. Ugh. But you know, he needs to shoot the ball better. We all, they all need to shoot the ball better. Murphy's good inside. Kind of compared Murphy and uh, Todd Gibson as sort of similar players to what they should be and what they do for their team. Sure. Kind of steady in the post. Kind of old school power forwards, rebounds and, and quick moves. So I think you know, a little undersized thing to see. Yeah, a little undersized, a lot of grit, and I think that's what you need uh, for Big Ten players now. Ochoa has got to toughen up, you know, because we're hitting that stretch, like you said, Michigan, Michigan State, tough, tough teams with a lot of experience. And if you can't get one of these two, Chris, it's going to be pretty rough to get some more going forward. Yeah, that's it, man. This is a big week in basketball for Minnesota fans, man. And we're going to know, you know, I titled, part of my title is, is the sky falling, question mark. Well, we're going to know if the the sky is falling on our Minnesota basketball scene. I'd say by next week, almost. I mean, I'm not the knee-jerk type of guy, but uh, four games, six nights, and then a need to go one and one, you know, in these games for the Gophers, Monday is going to be very telling on the Living and Loserville podcast, man. 
Yeah, it really is. And it, uh, hopefully we have good things to talk about because the, the opposite of that is not going to be fun at all. Yeah, it's going to be a 22-minute show, and we're just going to sign off. Go, go fuck yourselves. Have a good week um, because, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be one of those. All right, you got anything else, sir, before we uh, get the hell out of here? No, nope, we'll just look forward to see what's coming this week, and uh, wish both squads good luck. There we have it. Okay, that is Aaron and Chris signing off from the living, well, from Loserville, living in Loserville podcast. Enjoy the games. Let me coach the team. Just enjoy the games. Peace. Once you become the world champion, I believe that you feel you have so now, when as you fight, let's say you fight four or five years of straight survival, of the bullshit, of the whole bag, and when you come over camp, you're like, you know what, that made it. I'm going to show you it's this. So I'm going to get any, every dollar worth uh, of, of, of what I deserve. Why? Because I'm